Welcome to the Red Sneaker Podcast, your guide to success in the worlds of writing and publishing. Now, here's your host, best-selling author and founder of the Red Sneaker Writers Center, William Bernhardt. Hey everyone, thanks for joining me for the podcast. I've had a cold the past few days. I feel fine, but I don't think my voice is quite back to normal. So if I sound a little squeaky, that's why. Nonetheless, the Red Sneaker Podcast cannot wait. This episode features an interview with Kevin Tumblinson, who's an author, he's the host of the Word Slinger Podcast, and he's the managing director for draft to digital a company that provides support services for self-publishers. He'll talk about all that and much more. Ever wondered if it's possible to write a book in 30 days? He's written a book on the subject. Wondered whether you should venture into the world of self-publishing on your own or seek out help? He's got some answers there as well. But first, the news. My first news item concerns draft to digital the company we'll be talking about more in the interview. I was at the Novelist Inc. convention in Florida a few weeks ago where this interview was conducted. And they announced, draft to digital announced, they are expanding their business. In the past, they provided support to self-publishers venturing into the world of ebooks, But now they're going to expand that business into the world of print. In other words, they're going to help people generate print books as well. They're also going to expand into the shared world field of writing. Both of these seem well-timed to fill gaps that Amazon has created. As I've mentioned before, Amazon has decided to shutter Create Space, or perhaps more accurately, merge it with KDP, Kindle Direct Publishing. So no one's really sure what impact that's going to have on their ability to generate print editions. At any rate, draft to digital is going to provide that service to their customers. Some while ago, Amazon closed their Kindle Worlds function or feature, which was their shared world avenue, places where people could join and write works in universes created by other writers. draft to digital is going to venture into that field as well, starting with worlds that were in the Amazon program and then perhaps venturing to new ones as well. Now, full disclosure up front. I actually use draft to digital My wife and I both use them because we have a couple of publishing lines, not for our own books, but for other people's books. Usually, books we really like, authors we really like, people we're trying to give a leg up. And I've found draft to digital to be invaluable. Basically, they do all the stuff I don't want to do or is too cons- time-consuming to do and charge nothing up front. All they take is 10% of the profits, whatever they may be. So, or giving up less than you used to give in traditional publishing to your agent, you gain an enormous amount of time, which allows me to write more books. So for me, it's a good deal. But I just wanted to say up front, this is a company I know well. I've used them. They exhibited at our writers' conference this year, and I'm hoping they'll be back next year. So I am not impartial on this subject. Nonetheless, I think plussing their already terrific business by adding support for print books is a great addition. A couple of other news items I want to mention. First, with regard to Amazon. I talked last time about Amazon's brick-and-mortar bookstores. Basically, they have three models for bookstores at this point. They've got the pop-up stores, the little ones that you see in airports or sometimes in Whole Foods grocery stores. They've got the larger, more Barnes & Noble-like stores. And as I mentioned in the last podcast, they've now opened up these four-star stores, which basically feature books and other products on sale at the Amazon website that have four-star reviews or better. Clearly, they're experimenting trying to see which version will work best. Well, the reason it's back in the podcast this week is that about a week and a half ago, I was in New York on business, and I got to go into my first 
Amazon brick and mortar store. And I kind of liked it. It's a nice store, actually. It's a good facility. The selection of books was not as large as what you might see at a Barnes and Noble, but they still had a lot of books. And certainly all of the top titles that you would expect to find in a bookstore. It was clean. It was well organized. And of course, the big plus is if you're an Amazon Prime member, all you've got to do is hold up your phone already logged into the Amazon Prime app and you can check out in about a second and a half. It's a nice bonus for Amazon Prime members. And I suspect that that's part of the reason these stores exist. I mean, some people have wondered, why does Amazon even want to do brick-and-mortar stores? They already dominate the online business. Even a successful chain of bookstores could only add so much to their bottom line. What is the point? I suspect, to some extent... It is just an enhancement, maybe I shouldn't say just, but it is an enhancement of the online bookstore. It's very visible, particularly in places like the bookstore I visited near Times Square in New York City, and it enhances the business. You know, it gives people a chance to see the books and then buy them on Amazon. Uh, And perhaps to some extent, their incursion in the world of brick and mortars designed to forestall other people from doing the same thing. But basically, I see it as just one of many enhancements to their online business. Amazon is always experimenting, and now they're experimenting with physical bookstores. And judging by the number of people I saw in that store, and it wasn't even rush hour, and yet it was packed. So judging from that, it's an early success. And of course, most importantly, it had a coffee shop. Because, of course, in the 21st century, you cannot have a bookstore without a coffee house. One last news item relating to that other brick-and-mortar bookstore chain, Barnes & Noble. You may recall in a previous podcast, I predicted the possibility of Barnes & Noble being purchased by some outside entity. Turns out, I may have been right. Barnes & Noble formally announced last week that it has set up a, quote, formal review process to evaluate strategic alternatives for the company, end quote, because they've received multiple expressions of interest in buying the company from various sources, but the one that looks most possible or most promising is the one I mentioned in a previous podcast, Schottenfeld Management Corp. Remember, I noted that they had quietly increased their holding in Barnes & Noble stock, despite the fact that the stock seems to be losing value. There are several possible explanations for that, but one of the best is that they're thinking about taking over the company. To me, this creates a whole new ballpark. Barnes & Noble, with a new owner and new management that actually has a plan or making this company a financial success, well, that changes everything. That could change uh, what kind of books you want to write and what kind of physical media you want to follow for selling them. It's an important thing to follow. And of course, I'll continue to follow it in following podcasts. But the most important thing for me to remind you of now is I told you so. While I was at the Novelist Inc. convention in Florida, I had a chance to sit down and talk with Kevin Tumlinson, author and marketing director for draft to digital The irony is I had just seen Kevin a few weeks before at our own writers' conference in Oklahoma City, where he spoke on several panels and draft to digital was a sponsor and exhibitor. But we were both too busy to do much other than the conference there, so we finally got a chance to sit down and talk in Florida. Kevin is a terrific guy who is host of the Wordslinger podcast and director of marketing for draft to digital so there's really no aspect of this business he doesn't know a lot about. I suspect this interview could have gone on three times longer than it actually did. So don't be surprised if I have Kevin back on this podcast at some later time. Anyway, here's Kevin. 
Kevin, thanks for being on the podcast. Yeah, hey, I'm glad to be here. Okay. What is the best piece of advice you would offer somebody who wants to write? Uh, so the standard advice I give is, is write and publish. Because a lot of times people will write for months and years and leave those things in uh, in a folder somewhere on their hard drive and, and never actually get around to putting them out there. So if you're wanting a career in publishing these days, the best thing is to jump right into it, get going. And not much <laughs> excuse anymore for leaving things really sitting not. around at a desk drawer collecting dust. Yeah, right? there's really not. I mean, that those day, I think the days of the uh, desk drawer manuscript are kind of passing us by anyway. But right. uh yeah, plenty of people still have what I call their thirds, uh, which is the first third of a book that they started and were really enthusiastic about, never mm-hmm. completed. Uh, so it's really kind of two-part advice. It's write every day and publish often. Yeah, that's good <laughs> advice. Now, you have been all over the place in the publishing world. You've written yeah. many books. I think that's how you started, right? Right. I wrote, uh, yeah, right. And you've done podcasts, mm-hmm. we'll talk about that, and now you're director of marketing for Draft to Digital. Right. How did you get started writing? Uh, you know, I, I wrote my whole life, actually. I started, really? uh, I tell everyone I, I wrote my first book when I was five years old. Uh, I wrote a, basically a story on that one of those big chief notepads. Right. Uh, <laughs> you must have been step, young. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and, you know, my, my uh, stepfather uh really enjoyed it and really thought it was cool and that I'd written something. I called it a book. I drew a cover for it, you know, so. Oh, that makes a huge even, difference. Yeah, so I was even a uh, cover designer way back then. So <laughs> That'll be your next career. <laughs> yeah. I design all my own covers now, actually. Really? Yeah, yeah. I started wow. doing that uh, several years ago, mostly to save money, but then I got, you know, kind of the knack of, I have a design background on top of everything mm-hmm. else. So it was, uh, it was just a lot of fun to kind of learn the psychology of, cover design and mm-hmm. implement that sort of thing. So you're not just saying you kind of sketch out the idea. You actually get on the I, computer and put the cover together. Full on graphic design. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. I used to pay people for covers and then, you know, kind of realized I could do the same quality work you know, for mm-hmm. free. So it's kind of my way to finish the book now. That's <laughs> what you, next year at the conference, that's what you should be Co- teaching. Cover design for indie authors. <laughs> Why yeah. Why not? Save a few uh, bucks. Okay, so what was key to the translation from Big Chief Tablets to published author with books out there? You know, could buy? I uh, early in my life I connected the idea of writing and money. Uh, I wrote professionally. I, I tell people uh, at twelve years old I got a job writing uh, teen beat content for our local paper. <laughs> Really? Um, Where so was I, that? That was in uh, Brazoria County, Texas. Wow. Uh, our, our local paper down there. Mm-hmm. And, uh, you know, from there, I, I just I was constantly writing short stories in school instead of my papers. And, mm-hmm. you know, writing was just this thing that I did really well. Uh, I didn't have to try hard to do well. And mm-hmm. uh, I had a lot of encouragement from teachers. So that uh, makes a big difference. It does. <laughs> Quite a bit of difference. And once I left uh, high school, I started writing for college papers and I wrote for newspapers and magazines uh, you know, out sort of in a freelance capacity. and. I got into media and media involves a lot of writing, you know, mm-hmm. so I just had writing as this through line. I've had a plethora of careers. I mean, I, mm-hmm. I've actually worked in just about every field you can imagine. And uh, writing was always sort of my way in. Mm-hmm. I have this obsession when I get interested in something, I, I have to go become that thing for a while. Right. Right. So, Until you've mastered it. And then, and then it's time to it. move on. That's, I know exactly what That's you're talking about. That's why my resume looks like an Indeed posting. Right. I've never so, subscribed to the theory that you, you know, learn how to do one thing and then do it no. for 50 years. No, I think writers by nature, uh, we're, we're curious about everything. That's why we write. We write to explore things in a pretty safe and controlled environment and uh, to master a subject. Okay, so you've written a lot of books. I know you've written the uh, the archaeological mysteries or yeah, thrillers. Yeah, archaeological thrillers. That's and, my. Uh, are those style. your favorites, or do you have? That favorites? is my favorite. Yeah, the, so I started life writing uh, sci-fi and fantasy. Um, I started with a. I had a traditional contract, you know, in the early two thousands, and uh, kind of figured out it wasn't going to benefit me much financially. I was going to lose money on the deal, mm-hmm. uh, so I bought that out. I lost the rights to the book for a while. And uh, was pretty much going to give up on writing until I uh, kind of stumbled across the idea of 